everybody, my name is Erin Mormon and I'm this year's uh, coordinator for Carpe Artistas Rock Camp called Jukebox Hero that starts in just a few weeks. So in the meantime, we really want to brag on our instructors and the volunteers that will be join joining us for this year. They have so much value and knowledge that they bring to our students at Jukebox Hero and they really make it worthwhile for our students. So today I have with us Steve Bowman. So Steve, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself and about your career in the music industry? Well, great. Um, uh, I have uh, spent the last 30 years as a professional drummer. And in that time, I think I've done it all. <laughs> I was making a list of, of uh, places I played recently. And I was thinking, man, I've played clubs, theaters, stadiums, uh, basements, truck beds. You know, I've... Uh, I've uh, pretty much done it all, I think, in the last 30 years. That's so, awesome. Uh, but. So tell us, you have actually been the drummer for Counting Crows in, the, in some point in your career. So why don't you tell yeah. us a little bit about how you got there and what you did with Counting Crows? Yeah. Well, I was the original drummer. Uh, we did a record called August and Everything After back in 1993. And it had a huge hit song called Mr. Jones, mm -hmm. which allowed us to go all over the country and uh, all over the world and play on all my favorite TV shows. And it was very exciting. Uh, I did that. Uh, we toured for a couple of years and uh, I went on and did a, a, you know, played with a bunch of different bands and and recording and touring and writing and yeah. uh you know i found in a music career the more um ways you can uh do it the better it is financially and uh you know i i got into writing and started writing articles for magazines and, yeah. and doing a blog and and uh, doing all kinds of different stuff but always teaching recording touring and uh and so, yeah, that's been it. That's awesome. So I feel like the kids who are watching this are going to be really interested in what your experience was touring with Counting Crows and playing these big stadiums and arenas. So tell us a little bit what that was like, you know, going city to city every night and all of the, the you know, big lights, things that kids dream about growing up. Yeah, well, you know, I'm so lucky because that's what I always dreamed about. And I was able to do it, you know, uh, and, and, uh, I remember we we did the Rolling Stones tour as the opening band. It's like <clears throat> just doesn't get any bigger than that. And, yeah. and one of the things I remember was uh, right before we'd go on stage, there was this scaffolding we'd walk up, and then we'd go on the stage, and there was this little bar right above where we'd walk on. And the first night, I jumped up and just started doing pull ups because <laughs> I had so much energy. Yeah. And the guys in the band said, hey, man, don't do that. You're going to be too tired. I was like, man, I could do this all day. Yeah. And I did like 30 pull-ups. <laughs> and I was like, let's go. Yes, you that's know? so awesome. Uh, I remember uh, the the uh, just feeling so much energy. Like we played for 80,000 people at the, oh. what, the Hoosier Dome or something. It's just like, <laughs> incredible. Yeah. Um, and then. I also remember, uh, you know, one of the great things about music for me has been traveling mm -hmm. and like, wow, I'm in Paris and I'm getting paid to be here. You know, yeah. uh, besides Counting Crows, I went on, you know, I did a lot of stuff and spent a lot of time uh, touring and, and recording and, uh, and just, you know, I feel so lucky uh, to, well, the luckiest thing actually is that um, I have what they call mailbox money. Uh, mm -hmm. if you, uh, if you get royalties on a, on a big record or couple, uh, you can, uh, kind of make a living every six months, you get a check from BMI. Yeah. So between that and doing some teaching, uh, I'm able to, uh, have a pretty comfortable life. Awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. so you mentioned teaching and all of uh, your passions for that and how you just do that now as a kind of a side job away from your mailbox money. Uh, so tell us a little bit about um, how you got into teaching and what you do now with your teaching. Well, one of the things that I was really looking to do, it almost sounds corny, but I got to a point in my career where I really 
felt like I wanted to help people directly. Yeah. And it would have sounded corny to me uh, 10 or 20 years ago, but that's really how I felt. And it didn't even need to be drumming. I, mean, I was going around and like just uh, discovering the feeling of helping someone directly. I mean, you know, even if you helped an old lady get peanut butter yeah. at the grocery store, it makes you feel, it gives you energy. It, makes it you, does. You know, I discovered that if I could do that a lot, it made me really happy. Yeah. And, and I'd been teaching a little, but then I started getting into it in a different way and not just as a way to make money or, or, uh, you know, keep busy, but as a way to directly influence, maybe save time, money or effort off someone's career. Yeah. That really became a joy to me. And I started working with uh, a lot of kind of aspiring professionals in Nashville. Uh, we moved from Nashville um, a year ago to Murfreesboro. And what I really love was getting someone who is kind of on the verge, an aspiring professional. And yet they're at a point where they're great playing wise. They just don't know what to do next. Yeah. And so there's a lot of tips after 30 years that I, I feel I can help folks with. And maybe what should you be working on? What should you be looking at? Uh, how should you be thinking? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so there's a lot of great teachers that can teach the basics. And I do that at Carpe Artista. Uh, but I also love uh, working with all level players um, and, and uh, you know, helping directly yeah so um so you were mentioning talking to the aspiring professional and kind of having to push them over the edge to actually go after what they want um what is one of the most common pieces of advice that you have to give those young professionals or aspiring professionals yeah. um that you think is the most helpful well one of the important things is to know who is hiring in this business now for me yeah. And you, you may want to be an opera singer or you may want to be the drummer in Hamilton, you know? Yeah. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to do was make records and tour. And I happened to love pop rock, you know, mm -hmm. which when I came to Nashville in 2006, the drumming in country music is basically rock and roll. Now, yeah. <laughs> you know? And uh, with explosions and lasers, you know, it isn't uh, yeah. Garth Brooks anymore. But <laughs> So it worked out perfectly for me because I could hit hard and simple and, and uh, go right in there. But uh, what I love, that's what I love doing. I can't remember what, what your question even was. Uh, um, what the like most common piece of advice is that you would give to right. a young musician. So, so what I tell players is um, who's hiring. Mm -hmm. And when you realize that in my, for my path, singer, songwriters, producers, band directors. Those are who you need to impress to get a gig. Yeah. So then the next question is, what are they looking for? And uh, the, there's answers. And uh, and then what are they not looking for? And, uh, you know, I, I remember uh, years ago uh, when I was probably 20, 21, going into this big audition way over my head. And the guy asked me a couple questions and said, Hey, thanks so much, man. Why don't you leave your number with the uh, receptionist and we'll get back with you if we, if we need you. Basically he weeded me out just by asking me questions. Didn't yeah. hear me drop. Well, so what did I do wrong? What should I have said? What should I have been feeling? And the, there's answers, you know, how could I have gotten that gig? Well, I could have, uh, come in a little differently. How would you know, unless you've done this for 30 years, you know, yeah. uh, or 10 or 15. Uh, but, uh, but so that's one of the things you, if you have a, a young player uh, that is really great, they've worked hard, they're ready to, to get in there, but they don't know quite what to do. Um, there are things to focus on that will impress the people that hire. Yeah. And uh, so, and you may be into Latin jazz. You're a Latin jazz bassist. Well, all right. Uh, there are ways to get into that world too, uh, yeah, which totally. may be a little different. You know, um, I uh, 
had a, a student once that wanted to be a concert percussionist. And so I got into that kind of world and, and started looking at what's the hierarchy of that? If yep. you want to play with the Boston Pops, you know, that's like the New York Yankees of mm -hmm. the symphony or, or uh, you know, London Symphony Orchestra. You know, how does the French horn player get to that level, yeah. you know? Because there is a path that wasn't just, oh, everybody's great and this one walked through this door and now they're in the, you know. It's all about making the right connections. Connections and knowing what, you know, uh, knowing what you need to know and showing them that you know what you need to know. Exactly. But, yeah, I mean, when I got into that audition at 21, I was like, geez, he must have realized they'd have to teach me too much. So <laughs> next, <laughs> you know. For sure. So, so you have yeah. so much advice that you can give to young artists. And you mentioned to me before we started the interview, um, an upcoming podcast that you've been working on and are hoping to release soon. So why don't you tell me a little bit about what the goal is in that and what your heart is there? Yeah. Um, what I'm doing is, that's my cat, Jean. I don't know if you can hear it. <laughs> uh, I, uh, after 30 years, you can imagine, like, I've forgotten more stuff than I learned. You know? <laughs> and so what I decided was um, it would be really beneficial to young players if somebody that had gone through this process for decades could put together ideas that might help um, start to finish. And so I got the, and again, it was trying to help people directly. You know, um, my idea was to write a book on everything I wish I'd known when I was 20 about the music business. And, and I met with a book uh, marketer who convinced me to do a podcast and I didn't want to do it at first, but I realized what I'm trying to do is convey information. And this is a very effective way to do yes. it. Um, even for an old 54 year old like me. Uh, so I got together with a couple of guys, we organized some stuff and, and uh, I first had to organize all this information and I did and put it into 10 parts. And so we're going to record a 10 part podcast called tentatively called letters to a young musician. And uh, we're going to start do the first podcast in, in a, within the next couple of weeks. That is so still, awesome. Yeah. I, I still need to get a microphone, but uh, <laughs> uh, you have to get all this stuff. Uh, but anyway, I'm very excited about that because what I think I can do is get all this info into one place where if anybody's interested, they can find it. And I just really know it will help. I mean, if you took any career, a plumber, a nurse, an astronaut, whatever you got, if you took anybody after 30 years and, you know, said to them, hey, do you have any tips? I mean, like, where do you start? Yes. Do I have any tips? Well, yeah. And, uh, I don't know if you know the great Malcolm Gladwell, the uh, writer. He has a book uh, where he he talks about 10,000 hours of any activity making an expert, mm -hmm. right? You probably heard that. So yes. if you've done anything for 10,000 hours, you're an expert in it. And that would require that I played drums for about an hour a day over my career, which I don't know if I did it every day, but there were some days when I did more than that. So. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I joke that I'm probably also an expert at sitting in a van on tour and sitting in an airport waiting for, a, you know, yeah. I, I've done a lot of things for 10,000 hours. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so if, if that's the case, uh, then how can I help others? You know? That is uh, such an awesome way to look at it. And we are so glad that you are willing to share with us this year at Jukebox Hero. Um, we know that you're going to have a lot to bring. So parents and students who are watching, this is Steve Bowman, and we are so excited to have him. We know that he's going to teach your kids so much, and we're going to have an awesome time at uh, Jukebox Hero Rock Camp, July 19th through 23rd. We hope that you join us. Jukebox Hero.